put up the subversion. Said on the Navy address that of honor from them. For often, when you take down the stuff, the one from the Ghana country, and the Ghana system cover, ready for the service, Captain Robert Fletcher, would be done. What is the subversion?
honorable members, order, order, order. Honorable members, let us have some order in the house. The house is privileged to have the presence of His Excellency Nana Adu Dankwa Kufuadu, President of the Republic of Ghana and Commander in Chief of the Ghana Armed Forces in the House. His Excellency the President is here in accordance with Article 67 of the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana to deliver a message on the state of the nation to this Honorable House. On behalf of leadership and honorable members of this August House, it is my privilege and singular honor to welcome His Excellency the President of the Republic to the House. Honorable members, order. Honorable members, you are addressing the speaker. Order in the house. Honorable members, I have the greatest pleasure in inviting His Excellency the President to deliver his message. Your Excellency, you may now deliver your message. Mr. Speaker, it is always good to be back in Parliament and to discharge the duty in accordance with Article 67 of the Constitution of delivering to the House a message on the state of the nation. I am particularly delighted as this message is the first of my second term. The validity of which was unanimously upheld which was unanimously upheld last week in a well-reasoned and excellent ruling by a seven-member panel of the Supreme Court, presided over by the Chief Justice on 4th March 2021. In accordance with protocol and convention, it is good to see that First Lady Rebecca Kufuado, Vice President Mohamedou Baumia, Second Lady Samira Baumia, the spouse of Mr. Speaker, Chief Justice Enin Yabua, and Justices of the Supreme Court,
re-elected, re-elected chairperson Nana Utwosirbo II and members of the Council of State, the new Chief of Defense Staff, Vice Admiral Sef Amwama, the Inspector General of Police, Mr. James Opombuenu, and service chiefs are all present, as are the dean and members of the diplomatic corps. Let me use this opportunity to congratulate once again the Speaker of Parliament, the Right Honorable Alban Kingsford Sumani Bagman, on becoming Speaker of the Eighth Parliament. His has been a distinguished career. Having entered the first parliament of the Fourth Republic in 1993, and I came to meet him in the second parliament in 1997. He has been majority leader, minister of state, one of the three wise men in a previous government. Second Deputy Speaker of Parliament and now finds himself in this elevated position of being the third most important person in the governance structure of our country. It is wholly appropriate that at such a cr crucial period in the history of our country, my senior in Parliament and I should work together for the well-being of the Ghanaian people. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I wish you well in the discharge of the duties of this high office. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, I was here for the first time as President of the Republic, having won the election of 2016, and having erected, inherited a faltering economy and an expectant people. Between that time and 2010, I saw deliver on the mandate reposed on me and my party, the new patriotic party, and gain once again the confidence of the Ghanaian people. It was by no means a straightforward task. We were able to deliver on most of our 2016 promises. In spite of the considerable challenges we confronted and the setbacks we encountered, we were confident our record in office would put us in good stead before the electorate and earn us a second term in office which it did. It means that the reason for which the Ghanaian people went to the polls on 7th December, that is to seek an improvement in their living standards and the rapid transformation of the economy, must continue in earnest. It means that the clarion call of four more for Nana and the MPP to do more for you must be realized and I intend to do so. The commencement of this process has been facilitated by members of this house and I'm thankful to you for enabling government to be duly constituted the expeditious and thorough manner in which my ministers were scrutinized by the appointments committee and the approval by the full house of each of the 29 substantive ministers was for me an indication of the collective determination of both sides of the house with mutual regard for each other to work together for the good of the country. This 
is what the Ghanaian people demand from us by insisting on virtual parity in the house between the two major parties of our country. The realization of the Ghana project and not the attainment of narrow partisan interests must be the guiding principle of the business to be conducted in the house. As President of the Republic, I give my commitment, my firm commitment to this end. And I assure Mr. Speaker and the Legislature of the cooperation of the Executive in this endeavor. As I indicated in my acceptance speech on the night of 9th December 2020, now is the time for each and every one of us irrespective of our political affiliations, to unite, join hands, stand shoulder to shoulder, and work hard to place Ghana where she deserves to be. Mr. Speaker, in the face of a global pandemic that has ravaged lives and livelihoods in all parts of the world, we cannot afford to pursue interests that will leave our nation and its citizens the poorer for it. COVID-19 has impacted heavily on economic activities, created uncertainty, weakened global growth conditions, whilst putting undue strain on already weak and fragile health systems, particularly in developing countries. Mr. Speaker, between 2017 and the first quarter of 2020, we had made considerable gains in the management of the national economy, where we witnessed annual average GDP growth of 7%, single-digit inflation, reduced fiscal deficits with three consecutive years of primary surpluses, a relatively stable exchange rate, a significant improvement in the current account with three consecutive years of trade surpluses, strong foreign exchange reserve buffers, markedly reduced lending rates, and appreciable job creation. According to the COVID-19 Business Tracker Survey conducted by the Ghana Statistical Service in collaboration with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and the World Bank, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to job losses with many Ghanaian businesses and firms being forced to cut costs by reducing staff hours, cutting wages, and in some cases, laying off workers. This survey, again, showed that about 770,000 workers had their wages reduced, and about 42,000 employees were laid off during the three-week partial lockdown imposed on the Great Accra and Greater Kumasi metropolitan areas and their contiguous districts, Tema and Kaswa. Gawa government, however, succeeded in protecting the jobs and incomes of all public sector employees. Indeed, the cost of COVID-19 has been enormous. Our overall economic growth rate for 2020 was reviewed downwards from 6.8% to 0.9%. The non-oil economy was also revised from 6.7% to 1.6%. Revenue shortfall was estimated at 13.5 billion CDs with additional expenditures related to 
stemming the tide of COVID-19, estimated at 11.8 billion CDs, with a combined effect amounting to 25.3 billion CDs, or 6.6% of GDP. The resultant fiscal deficit for 2020 was thus revised from 4.7% of GDP to 11.4% of GDP. This was done to reflect the impact of the pandemic. The fiscal responsibility rule of keeping a deficit within the threshold of 5% of GDP and a positive primary balance for every year was suspended in 2020 to enable fiscal operations to accommodate the impact of the pandemic. I indicated at the time that we know what to do to bring the economy back to life. What we do not know how to do is to bring people back to life. That is why government did not hesitate to institute measures to protect the lives and livelihoods of Ghanaians, even if it was to the de temporary detriment of our much sought after fiscal stability. The formulation and implementation of the COVID-19 preparedness and responsible plan, tracing, testing, treatment, waiver of personal income tax, and provision of an additional 50% basic salary allowance to healthcare workers, expanding the capacities of laboratories to increase COVID-19 testing, establishment of isolation centers in all regions and districts, fumigation of markets and schools, provision of food packages and hot meals for residents in areas affected by the partial lockdown, provision of free water for all households, provision of free electricity for lifeline consumers, and a 50% discount for all other consumers. Reduction in the communication service tax from 9% to 5%. The institution of a 750 million CD loan facility for micro, small, and medium enterprises. Through the CAP bus initiative and the provision of a 2 billion CD guarantee facility to support large businesses such as schools and pharmaceutical companies are amongst the several measures put in place by government to cushion Ghanaians from the impact of the pandemic. Support has also been forthcoming from the Bank of Ghana under its brilliant leadership, which has lowered the monetary policy rate by 150 basis points to 14.5 percent, reduce the primary reserve requirement from 10 percent to 8 percent, reduce the capital adequacy requirement from 13 percent to 11.5 percent, and reduce interest rates on the Ghana reference rate to 200 basis points. The Ghana Revenue Authority has also extended the dates for filing of taxes from four months to six months after the end of the base year. Issued a waiver on VAT, national health insurance levy, and get fund levy on donations of equipment and goods for fighting the pandemic. Waived income taxes on third tier pension withdrawals and permitted the, production, the deduction of contributions and donations towards COVID-19 as allowable expenses for tax purposes. Mr. Speaker, 
My government found the resources to cushion the impact of the pandemic because we are good managers of the economy. And we are good protectors of the public purse. Mr. Speaker, the pandemic has exposed the need to expedite the process of moving Ghana to a situation beyond aid. That is why government has developed and is currently implementing the 100 billion CD Ghana Cares About Tampa program to transform, revitalize and modernize our economy and return it to high and sustained growth for the next three years. The key projects under the CARES program include A, supporting commercial farming and attracting educated youth into commercial farming. B, building the country's light manufacturing sector. C, developing engineering machine tools and ICT digital, digital economic industries. D, fast track digitalization. E, developing Ghana's housing and construction industry. F, establishing Ghana as a regional hub. G, reviewing and optimizing the implementation of government flagships and key programs. And H, creating jobs for young people and expanding opportunities for the vulnerable in society, including persons with disabilities. The establishment of the National Development Bank under the Ghana Cares Program is expected to provide financial support to businesses in Ghana. Government expects economic activity, which is already picked up, to do so even further following the ongoing vaccination exercise and the easing of restrictions put in place to curb the effects of the disease. We expect GDP growth to rebound strongly this year to nearly 5% above the IMF 2021 January projection of 3.2% growth for Sub-Saharan Africa for 2021. The, med, the medium term outlook supported by the implementation of the Ghana's CARES program is bright. We are confident that together we will emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic with a stronger and more resilient economy. Mr. Speaker, if we are to see the rebirth and growth of our economy, our people must be healthy and not succumb to COVID-19. On 24 February, government secured the first batch of vaccine dose, doses from the COVID facility. The ca vaccination campaign is currently ongoing with 262,335 number of Ghanaians receiving the first dose of the vaccines as at 10.30 a.m. this morning. The target is to vaccinate 20 million Ghanaians and government is working hard towards realizing this goal. We remain on course to taking delivery of some 17 million 600,000 vaccine doses by June with more to come in the course of the year. I want to urge members of the House to lend their voices to the public education campaign currently ongoing with regards to the vaccination program. The vaccine, together with strict compliance with the safety protocols, is what will allow us to open up our country again and embark on the, con on the quest to restore normalcy to our lives and livelihoods. Government is also mindful 
of a problem associated with vaccinations, and that is how to dispose of used PPEs, vials, needles, and syringes that are being used in the vaccination exercise. The government is collaborating with the private sector to establish 14 medical waste treatment facilities across the country to help address once and for all the safe disposal of medical waste. The pandemic, Mr. Speaker, has emphasized the need to expand access to health care for every Ghanaian, irrespective of his or her location. And I want to thank again and again all our frontline health care workers for their devotion to duty and sense of patriotism. The great amount of work undertaken by government has meant that we presently have some 300 and seven functioning and well-equipped ambulances under the One Constituency, One Ambulance Initiative. Supported by a state-of-the-art digitized command center to field emergency calls and to dispatch ambulances. Last year, 33 major health projects were approved for implementation at the cost of 890 million euros. Key amongst them are the Koforidia Regional Hospital, Tema General Hospital, the Nephrology and Urology Center at Kolibu, redevelopment of the Fear and Quanta Hospital into a teaching hospital, and the construction of a new regional hospital at Agna Quanta in the Western region. As announced last year, Agenda 111, which will see to the construction of 100 bed district hospitals in 101 districts with no hospitals, seven regional hospitals for the new regions, including one for the western region, the construction of two new psychiatric hospitals for the middle belt and northern belt, respectively and the rehabilitation of Enfia the Quanta Hospital in the Western region is on course. Construction of some of these hospitals has commenced and will continue without interruption. Agenda 111, the largest ever investment in healthcare infrastructure in our history. is part of a massive vision for Ghana's healthcare sector, the realization of which will lead Ghana becoming a center of medical excellence and a destination for medical tourism, and will also see us achieve the following. Each of the 16 regional hospitals will be designated as a center of excellence in the different specialized of medicine. For example, orthopedic surgery, burns, plastic and reconstructive surgery, breast care center, fertility center, neonatology and pediatric center, neurosurgery and spine center, stroke center, heart and kidney center, and mental health center, to name a few. Continuously, secondly, continuously upgrade our medical curriculum and continue to train our young doctors and healthcare professionals in a world-class fashion. Three, incentivize the private sector to increase capacity to support demand in healthcare delivery. And four, encourage Ghanaian medical experts in the diaspora to collaborate and join hands with us to help build and contribute to the realization of this noble vision. The West African region is estimated to reach a population of half a billion by 2020, by which time 
this vision would have been realized. The government will continue to invest in the health sector and will continue to recruit more health professionals in addition to the 100,000 recruited in my first term for our health facilities. Electri electronic medical record system, e-health deployment is currently underway following its implementation in key health facilities like Kolebu, Konfuanoche, Ho, Tamale, and Cape Coast Teaching Hospitals, and several district hospitals in the central region. Upper East, Upper West, and Bono Regional Hospitals will go live on the e-health platform in five days. Mr. Speaker, when it was needed most, at the height of the pandemic, the ingenuity and creativity of the Ghanaians showed through, which caught the attention of the world. When PPEs were being sold on the world market at extortionist prices, largely because demand outstripped supply, we began producing them in Ghana. Scrubs medical gowns, sanitizers, masks, and gloves. All of these essential to the fight against COVID-19 were produced in Ghana. In total, 14,600,000 pieces of personal protective equipment have so far been produced domestically for health workers, students, teaching and non-teaching staff of tertiary and secondary educational institutions. We are determined to make our own things, and the Akufuado government will continue with the agenda of rapid industrialization, with the aim of transforming the structure of the Ghanaian economy from one dependent on the production and export of raw materials to a value-added industrialized economy. Under the One District, One Factory initiative, 232 projects are at various stages of implementation. These include 76 operating as 1D1F companies, whilst 112, including five medium-sized agro-processing factories. The 63 common user facilities are under construction. Open your eyes, you'll see them. The Ghana, the Ghana Integrated Aluminum Development Corporation has made good progress on the bauxite exploitation program that will drive our industrial transformation agenda. We are in the final stage of an open and transparent investor engagement process and are in negotiations to select strategic investors to partner GIADEM for the bauxite mining and alumina refinery projects. The selected partners will be announced imminently. Similarly, the Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation, GISDEC, has been set up and has begun its work in earnest. We have succeeded in attracting major global vehicle manufacturers under the automotive development policy to set up in Ghana. So far, Volkswagen has produced 1,167 vehicles Sino truck, 276 vehicles, and our own Kantanka has produced 400 vehicles. The Japanese conglomerate, Nissan, has also started the assembly of vehicles in the country. Mr. Speaker, our nation's food resilience has been severely tested over the past year. The closure of borders in the midst of the pandemic meant that we have had to depend largely on food we produced. 
We have fared well under the circumstances, largely as a result of the bold policies implemented by government since 2017, such as the program for planting for food and jobs, rearing for food and jobs, the One Village, One Dam initiative, the One District, One Warehouse policy, the establishment of greenhouse villages, revitalization of the Coco Rehabilitation Program, and the reactivation of our outdoor culture industry. I'm happy to inform the House that during this period of the pandemic, we have experienced no food shortages in this country. There have been increases in maize and rice yields by 110% and 48% respectively. We have for the first time in a long while become a net exporter of food as opposed to the days of importation of tomatoes and plantain. Indeed, in 2019, we exported some 140,000 metric tons to our neighbors. We are determined to take full advantage of the African continental free trade area to produce more in Ghana, to sell more to Africa and beyond as we move Ghana beyond aid. The agree agreement for strategic partnership between Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire has bound our two countries in even closer intimacy, especially in the cocoa sector. We have succeeded in aligning the cocoa production and marketing policies of the two countries and ensured that we do not continue to be victims or pawns of a global cocoa industry that is dependent on the toil and effort of our farmers. A new trading mechanism has been implemented and has ensured that a new cost item of 400 United States dollars per ton for every cocoa sold by the two nations, effective from the 2021 season, is paid to our farmers. Through the establishment of the Tree Crop Development Authority, the government is determined to end the over-reliance on cocoa and develop other cash crops such as cashew, cotton, mango, oil palm, rubber, and shear. The government remains committed to the completion of the many harbors and landing sites, which are different stages of completion in Senya Breku, Disco, Almina, Moray, Winneba, Gumwafete, Kesi. Keta, Mumford, and Jamestown. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I am passionate about the education of every child in Ghana. Because education opens doors. That is why one of my biggest concerns during this pandemic has been to safeguard the education of our children. All over the world, governments were forced to shut down schools as we did. However, we took steps to ensure that the education of our children was not truncated. Last year, bold and responsible decisions made it possible for JHS3 and SHS3 students to take their final examination. And final year university students graduated. Currently, all our children from kindergarten to university are in school, studying in conditions of safety. This has taken place despite the outcry and opposition of some. I am required to provide leadership, and that is what I am doing.
government, through the ministries of education and health, is doing all they can to ensure that the future of our children is not jeopardized by the pandemic. In 2020, the first batch of free SHS students wrote their WATSI successfully. Results of the 2020 WATSI indicates that more than 50% of candidates who sat the examination obtained A1 to C6 in all core subjects. This was an impressive WATSI performance with over 60% of candidates scoring between A1 and C6 in their best six subjects, including English and mathematics, which qualifies them for tertiary education. Mr. Speaker, 64 years after independence, we still do not have the critical mass of tertiary education graduates that is required for our socio-economic transformation. Currently, Ghana's gross tertiary enrollment ratio stands at 18.8%, which, albeit very low, is still one of the highest in Africa. We must therefore introduce measures to increase consciously the proportion of our population with relevant tertiary education to accelerate the transformation of our country. Our target is to increase the ratio from the current 18.8 percent to 40 percent by 2030, focusing on science, technology, engineering and mathematics, STEM-related fields with emphasis on engineering. This will be achieved by significantly increase, increasing enrollment in existing public and private universities and through the establishment of an open university. We expect record numbers of enrollment over the next four years. Accordingly, we will fulfill our campaign manifesto promise by removing the guarantor requirement that makes it difficult for most students to apply for loans through the Student Loans Trust Fund program. As part of our commitment to the advancement of STEM, government will continue with the development of 20 STEM centers at eight model sites, senior high schools across the country. These institutions will be fitted with state-of-the-art equipment and laboratories, which will facilitate teaching and learning in all areas, including artificial intelligence and robotics. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank this August House for passing the Education Regulatory Bodies Act 2020, Act 1023. The passage of this Act has established the Commission for Technical Vocational Education and Training, CTVET, and the TVET service. All these will help to streamline delivery of TVET and avoid overlaps and duplication. We're also building 32 TVET institutions across the country to augment existing infrastructure for effective TVET delivery. In line with our commitment to address the issue of youth in unemployment through TVET, government will commence the implementation of the Ghana Jobs and Skills Project this year. The project seeks to expedite the development of competency-based training curricula on the national TVET qualification framework for 100 trades professions from level one national proficiency to level five higher national diplomacy, as well as training some 25,000 beneficiaries and provide entrepreneurial support to about 50,000 individuals. It will also seek to implement the Ghana Labor Market Information System, 
an upgrade of district public employment centers and services. A key objective of our effort to improve quality education and ensure that our students become globally competitive is to maintain the integrity of our examinations and assessment. In, connect in connection with this, government working through WIAC will introduce new measures to curb examination leakages and malpractices. I acknowledge that the teacher is at the center of every reform in the field of education. Prioritizing the welfare of teachers remains a key objective of government. After the restoration of teacher training allowances, government is now paying professional allowances to both teaching and non-teaching staff. Something you found very difficult to do in eight years. I'm happy to announce the government is facilitating the acquisition of 280,000 laptops for members of the Ghana National Association of Teachers, GANAT, the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, and the Coalition of Concerned Teachers, CCT, this year. Moving forward, the Minister of Education will soon detail an action plan for the implementation of the national teacher policy. Government has also introduced several interventions at the high school level. Some of these are the 198 million CD academic intervention support program dedicated for extra classes for students in SHS implementation of free internet connectivity for secondary school, full absorption of BEC registration fee for all students in public junior high school from 2017 till date, and full absorption of vaccine registration for students which started last year. Mr. Speaker, our effort at digitization is gathering steam. When my government assumed office in 2017, we faced the challenge of a largely informal economy. The features of the informal economy included the absence of unique identification for citizens and residents of Ghana and the absence of a working property address system across the country. Further, only a small proportion of our population was registered by the Ghana Revenue Authority GRA with tax identification numbers, TINs, and by SNET for Social Security. 70% of the adult population did not have access to a bank account. Financial transactions were dominated by cash, and the processes of service delivery in most MDAs were largely manual and highly bureaucratic. It was in this context that we set about the process of formalizing our informal economy through digitization. Mr. Speaker, after four years in office, I'm happy to state that there's been more progress in formalizing the Ghanaian economy than there was in the previous 63 years since independence. Mr. Speaker, for the first time, we have enrolled 15.5 million people onto the national ID card system, the Ghana card and we will complete the process this year. From 1st April, and this is not an April Fool's prank, all national ID numbers will become tax identification numbers. In so doing, the number of people registered by GRA from tax purposes 
will increase from the current 3 million to 15.5 million. I should recall that at the end of 2016, only 750,000 people had TIN numbers. The increase to 15.5 million in just four years is simply phenomenal. Similarly, from the second quarter of this year, all national ID numbers will also become SNET numbers. This will increase the number of people on the SNET database from 4 million to 15.5 million, making it easier for new contributors to be enlisted on the scheme. The national ID numbers will also become NHIS numbers. Very soon, we will link the national ID to all SIM cards, bank accounts, births and death registry, DVLA documents, and passports. Speaker, for the first time, through the implementation of the digital property addressing system, every location in Ghana has a digital address. The process of affixing unique property address plates from se for some 7.5 million properties in all 16 regions has also started. Mr. Speaker, for the first time in Ghana, more than 70% of the population has access to financial services, either through a bank account or a mobile money account. We've been able to do so through the implementation of mobile money interoperability between bank accounts and mobile wallets with Ghana as the first and only country in Africa to have done so. It is therefore not surprising that Ghana is the fastest growing mobile money market in Africa. Furthermore, our successful introduction of the Universal Quick Response Code for payments across banks, telcos, fintechs and merchants will propel Ghana to be amongst the first countries in Africa, if not the first, to move towards a largely cashless economy when fully rolled out across the country with the support of the Bank of Ghana. Mr. Speaker, we have also digitized the operations of many government institutions, including the ports, NHIS, DVLA, GRA and the passport office. One of the most dramatic examples of this development has been the ability of SNIT to pay pensions within 10 days of application as opposed to the endless delays of the past. To make it easy to obtain government services, a portal Ghana.gov has been established where all MNBAs are being onboarded. It is a one-stop shop where anyone can apply for and pay for a government service. We expect to complete the onboarding of all MNBAs this year and in so doing significantly enhance the efficiency and reduce the cost of delivery of government services to our people. Mr. Speaker, the Integrated Customs Management Systems, ICOMS, which is an end-to-end -end customs management system at the ports to enhance management and collection of custom duties, has 
despite initial resistance and controversy, succeeded in eliminating the multiple routes to prior to payment of duties, ensuring seamless processes, increasing revenues, and speedy processing of pre-mass manifest declaration and valuation on the same system. We have also integrated the Ghana.gov platform and the integrated tax application pre preparation system, which allow taxpayers to make payments at their convenience online and through taxpayers' banks and the use of mobile money, credit cards, and debit cards. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that we have made significant strides in formalizing the economy, and we will do even more going forward. Mr. Speaker, our judicial system has not been left out of the digitization program. Today, the e-justice and e-case register initiatives, for example, are helping to ensure that the law keeps pace with technology, ending the age-old missing dockets phenomenon and endless litigation, which have plagued the efficient delivery of justice in the country for many, many years. Government through the Ministry of Local Government and the District Assembly Common Fund has commenced in an unprecedented initiative the construction of 90 courts with accompanying accommodation for judges across the country to help address the problem of inadequate court infrastructure. These structures are at advanced stages of completion. Again, through the same medium, 20 townhouses and a guest house are being built to, use, to be used as permanent residences for Court of Appeal judges based in Kumasi who are mandated to handle cases in the northern part of the country. With the coming into force of the Court's Regulation 2020, LI 2429 of 16th December 2020, the relevant sections of the Courts Act, Act 459, have been amended and has led to an expansion of the jurisdiction of the lower courts. Indeed, prior to the amendment, the monetary value of cases that could be had by the district and circuit courts were 20,000 and 50,000 CDs respectively. Today, the district court's jurisdiction over cases brought before it has been increased to 500,000 CDs, whereas that of the second court has been increased to 2 million CDs. Mr. Speaker, this increase in jurisdiction will ensure that more cases are heard in the district and circuit courts, thus easing the burden on the high courts. All these measures will go a long way to enhance justice delivery in the country and help consolidate the rule of law. Mr. Speaker, when I appeared before this House on 4th January 2021 to deliver the last message on the state of the nation at the dissolution of Parliament, I called for a national discourse on the land-standing issue of illegal small-scale mining in our country. Yes, in the last four years, so much has been achieved in cleaning up this industry training miners in the best methods of mining, introducing community mining, enacting additional regulatory legislation. But the reality is that illegal small sale mining remains a major problem. I am confident that the new energetic Minister for Lands and Natural Resources and a member of Parliament for Damango constituency the Honorable Samuel Abujinapo will rapidly facilitate the holding of this national dialogue and will work to build on the progress of his predecessors by enhancing regulation of this sector, which should be anchored on the protection of the environment and on community mining. The Speaker, 
Let me at this point assure the House that in the course of this session of Parliament, the government will come back to engage the House on the steps it intends to take on the future of the Ejapa transaction. Mr. Speaker, the land administration continues to be bedeviled with apparently intractable challenges. This year, government intends to roll out a program for the digitization of all land records for purposes of ensuring effective land administration. Aggressive afforestation will be pursued in the course of the year. The expected launch of a Green Ghana project, which will see the mobilization of Ghanaians in all fields of endeavor to participate in the nationwide tree planting exercise. Mr. Speaker, in 2018, Govern Ghana won the bid to host and organize the 2023 African Games for the first time since the tournament started in 1965. A nine-member local organizing committee has been constituted and inaugurated to handle the technical and events aspects of the 2023 Africa Games. Government intends to provide maximum support to the NLC to help ensure we organize and host successful games. The construction of 10 youth resource centers across the country which are different levels of completion between 85 and 95 percent. We are as well renovating and rehabilitating many other abandoned sports facilities. We're paying allowances to about 1,000 athletes through the youth employment agencies. The Ghana Premier League has started and hopefully when we return to normalcy, capping of spectators at the, at the stadiums will be a thing of the past. This is a proper occasion for me once again, on behalf of all Ghanaians, to congratulate the Black Satellites on their splendid victory in winning the nation's fourth under-20 African Nations Trophy when they defeated Uganda by two goals to none on Sunday in Nwaksho, capital of the Republic of Mauritania. I call to the Black Satellites and to the technical and management team for their Independence Day gift. I look forward to receiving them at Jubilee House later this afternoon, after I am done with, your, with you. To receive them this afternoon. Hopefully, this should be the beginning of a new era of success for Ghanaian football. Mr. Speaker, the creation of the six new regions led to the establishment of six new regional houses of cheese. In my tour of the country last year, I inaugurated these new houses and cut the sort of the construction of six new buildings for them, which are ongoing. Government through the Ministry of Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs We'll continue to engage our traditional and religious rulers in matters of our common interest, such as the protection and preservation of the environment. Government is also determined to provide the funding necessary for the judicial committees of the various houses of chiefs to be able to do their work effectively and efficiently so as to bring closure to many long-standing chieftaincy disputes. Mr. Speaker, our nation continues to benefit from the year of return. Since then, we have intensified our engagement with Africans in the diaspora and all persons of African descent, more positively, in areas such as trade and investment cooperation and skills and knowledge development in what we call beyond the return. The Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture together with its implementing agency, the Ghana Tourism Authority, is working towards the realization of this initiative, which will bring even greater spotlight on our nation, Ghana. A lot of work 
has been undertaken in revamping our tourist sites and making them attractive. Digital revenue collection systems have been installed at the Almina and Kekos castles, the Kwame Kuma Memorial Park, and Vili Waterfalls. Government has agreed, upgraded five tourism sites to meet international standards for increased visitation and create jobs and incomes for the people. The new minister for the sector, the industrial Ibrahim Awal Mohammed, has also indicated his determination to strengthen the creative arts industry in Ghana. Already, the first ever creative arts senior high school located in Kwadasu in Kumase in the Ashanti region, is nearing completion. The governing board of the National Film Authority is in place, and even greater attention will be paid to this sector by government. Mr. Speaker, our quest to ensure an improved sanitation system across the country was bolstered last year by the commencement of construction of 16 integrated recycling and solid waste processing facilities. It is expected that all 16 facilities will be completed before the end of the year. The Sustainable Rural Water and Sanitation Project and the Water Supply Improvement Project of the Ghana Spain Dead Swap Development Program have been completed. In September 2020, I joined the people of Amejofe, Jope, Akokope, Batume Junction, Mache, Jolubukame, and surrounding communities to commission the five pipe water supply systems under the project. Concrete preparatory works have also commenced on a number of water supply projects across the country, including the Waiting Water Supply Project, Kitao Water Supply Project, Five Districts Water Supply Scheme Phase 3, Tamale Water Supply Project, Damango Water Supply Project, and Yendi Water Supply Project. Our efforts at ending open defecation received a boost with the construction of 103,149 toilet facilities for vulnerable households in towns and villages across the country under the Household and Institutional Toilet Program. The, com the cumulative result of this has been that some 822,000 persons have benefited nationwide. Some 5,500 communities have also been declared open defecation free. Mr. Mr. Speaker, in the energy sector, the National Energy Policy 2020 has been completed to improve the framework and strategies to meet contemporary needs, energy needs of the country. The government has improved the financial sustainability of the next energy sector through several interventions, including paying up the energy legacy debt that you left. Furthermore, negotiations with independent power producers, the terms of whose contracts entail substantial financial charges on the state, are ongoing and should be completed by the end of the year. This should result in a more affordable cost of power for the Ghanaian people. Under the National Electrification Scheme, a total of 1,436 communities have been connected to the national grid, which has increased the national electricity access rate to 85.17% as of October 2020. My ambition is that by the end of my term, the figure will be 100%. The Ghana National Petroleum Corporation has accelerated petroleum ac exploration activities in the inland Voltaine Basin. 
It has successfully acquired and processed 2,538 line kilometer of 20 of 2D seismic data, analyzed 1,537 geochemical samples, and established a working petroleum system. A gas processing plant terrain is being constructed in the western region to complement the Atuabo gas processing plant so as to increase dry gas delivery for power and non-power uses. The Takradi portion of the Takradi Tema Interconnection Project, TTIP, has been completed with an increased capacity of gas exports from Takradi to Tema through the West African Gas Pipeline. GNPC and its private sector partners have advanced the work on the Tema LNG project, Sub-Saharan Africa's first LNG regasification terminal, which is expected to come on stream in the course of the year to improve gas supply reliability for power and non-power industrial applications. The facility will also become a hub of regional energy security, ensuring low-cost fuel for both Ghana and her partners in the ECOWAS community. Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of my first term of office in 2017, government outlined its social development goals to include the promotion of gender equity and equality, survival and development of children, as well as the harmonization of social protection interventions and programs to contribute to the development of our nation. I'm mean, pleased to inform the House that in the course of this session of Parliament, the new Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection, the Honorable Sarah Adjua Safo, MP, Member of Parliament for Domi Kwabenya, will resubmit to the House the Affirmative Action Bill. Our mothers, wives, sisters and daughters are looking up to us. Indeed, it will make our society the richer. And I'm appealing to the House on both sides to make one big effort to ensure its enactment. The Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty Program, LEAP, has increased the number of pay points from 7,000 to 200 to 14,000. 300 in order to make it easy for beneficiaries to access their grants. In all, a total of 334,438 households benefited from the program. The Ghana School Feeding Program currently feeds over 3,300,000 beneficiary pupils in some 9,000 kindergarten and primary schools with one hot nutritious meal every day per child. The Speaker, our commitment to the development of inner cities and zogo communities is unwavering. Projects such as the construction of classroom blocks, astroturfs, establishment of ICT centers, installation of street lights, entrepreneurial and vocational skills training, supporting needy students and the rehabilitation of access roads and drains have been undertaken. Another key policy initiative has been the reintroduction of the Arabic Instructors Program. The Zongo Coders Program and Start Hub Program are initiatives meant to redirect the energies of young men and women of Zongo communities into productive ICT ventures. So far, several hundred young men and women have been trained under these programs. Mr. Mr. Speaker, activities of the then Ministry of Special Development initiatives, like those of the Inner City and Zongo Ministry, have been brought under the ambit of the Presidency. The record of work undertaken in the Ministry was remarkable. 568 units of 10-seater community water closets, 
42 warehouses, 427 dams, 40 rural markets, 20 fully equipped community clinics, 307 fully equipped ambulances. The speaker, in the area of coastal management, we continue to improve the resilience of the country's coastline against tidal wave erosion that poses a significant threat to lives, livelihood, and properties of the people living along the coastline. Consequently, we've implemented a number of coastal protection works at Abwazi, Nkuntompo, Ajoa, Blekusu, Elmina, Dansoman, Amafu, Kuma, Dixco, Axim, Cape Coast, Commenda, Anumabo, and Ningo Pram Pram, which protect in all a total stretch of some 54 kilometers and at our various stages of completion. Government has also implemented the National National Food Flood Control Program with the overall goal of reducing the incidence of flooding across the country. The construction of the multi-purpose Pualugu Dam project is aimed at mitigating the regular floods that occur in the White Volta Basin, covering parts of the Upper East and Northeast regions. Preparatory activities started in 2020 and will be completed by the first half of this year, with actual construction commencing in the second half of this year. Commissioning is expected in 2025. It is the single largest investment in the northern part of Ghana made by any government. Once completed, it will add 60 megawatts of hydropower and 50 megawatts of solar power to the national grid, thereby improving the quality of power supply in the northern part of Ghana. The 25,000 hectare irrigation scheme will be bigger than the total size of all irrigated projects implemented in the country since independence and will boost food production in the northern part of Ghana, thereby boosting economic development in northern Ghana and creating jobs for the youth. Mr. Speaker, another important infrastructure development is the construction of the Buankra Inland Port which will transform totally inland trade and ease the movement of goods and services, especially for traders as well as for persons in our landlocked neighbors. The Korean contractors are due to start work any moment from now. Under housing, Mr. Speaker, the Government of Ghana Affordable Housing Program we seek to increase access to safe, secure, adequate, and affordable housing units across the country is also continuing in earnest. Thus far, 1,464 units in Bortiman, 1,027 in Asakori Mampo, and 312 housing projects have been completed in Kong. The Kumar, Kuforidua, Tamale, and Wa housing projects have been handed over to the State Housing Company Limited for completion. Speaker, it is my intention to place special emphasis on resolving the problems of the housing sector in the country because tackling the housing deficit is long overdue. Mr. Speaker, one of the ministries created in my first term as president was the Ministry of Railways Development. And the benefits of its creation are as showing. The government is mobilizing some $2 billion towards the development of railway infrastructure and services. To this end, the government has rehabilitated a section of the narrow gauge western line from Kujukum to Takwa through Insuta to facilitate the haulage of manganese from Insuta to the Takradi port and also to provide a passenger railway service along the corridor. Construction of a new standard gauge line from Kotokron through ACM to Mansu is also ongoing. 
A 500 million euro contract has been signed for the construction of a standard gauge railway line from Mansu to Huni Valley, a contract which includes the conversion of the narrow gauge tracks between Takradi and Sekendi to standard gauge, and the development of standard gauge tracks from the Takradi station to the Takradi port for efficient and effective access for cargo handling. The development of the project will result in the construction of 102 kilometers of rail tracks between the port of Takradi and Humni Valley. Contracts for standard gauge railway lines from Kumasi to Kasi, Kasi to Ebiadin, Ebiadin to Obwasi, Ebiadin to Ejisu, with the linkage to the Buankra Inland Port, Mansu to Dunkwa, have all been signed. The Tema to Mpakadan Railway Project is currently about 80% complete with the rehabilitation of the railway training school and two location workshops being completed. The Ghana School of Railways and Infrastructure Development, a school under the George Grant University of Mines and Technology, has matriculated its first batch of students and will begin awarding certificates in diplomats in engineering and other related courses. Mr. Speaker, in my inaugural address, I declared 2021 as the second year of Rhodes. This declaration is intended to continue to prioritize road construction so that road projects that started under the Height Sino Hydro facility will be completed, as well as interchanges that are at various stages of completion. Specific details of the road projects are going to be outlined in the budget that will be read on Friday. Mr. Speaker, government has granted policy approval for the establishment of the National Flag Carrier, a home-based airline with strategic partner participation. The House will be duly informed on developments in this area. Construction of the second and third phases of the Kumasi Airport, the second phase of Tamale Airport, and the rehabilitation of the Sunyani Airport are all proceeding satisfactorily. A decision on the siting of the proposed airport and the central and western regions is imminent. Mr. Speaker, in order to revive the fortunes of the Metro Mass public transport system, Government has provided a total of 100 new intercity buses for Metro Mass Transit Limited, an additional 100 buses for the Intercity STC Coaches Limited. The construction of a new dedicated container terminal at the terminal port is ongoing, and three out of the four berths have been completed to facilitate maritime and inland waterways tra transportation. The development of a multi-purpose container terminal at the Takradi port is progressing. Removal of tree stumps along the, nav the navigable pathway at the Dambai to Dambai Overbank, Yeji Mankango and Yeji Awojepo has been completed to improve the safety of navigation and reduce significantly accidents on the Volta Lake. The construction of ferry landing sites along the Volta Lake at Dambai and Dambai Overbank is 68% complete, whilst that of Yeji, Mankango and Agodeke is 46% complete. In total, seven rescue and high-speed patrol boats have been procured by the Ghana Maritime Authority and deployed into service to improve safety and security of our maritime domain and inland waterways. Mr. Speaker, our security services have been retooled and re-equipped substantially under this administration. Indeed, the first four units of four-story blocks of 16 flats under the Barracks Regeneration Project have been commissioned. In the remaining part of a 42-bedroom self-contained accommodation units for the 6th Battalion of Infantry and Airborne Force in Tamale have also been completed. 
pickups, SUVs, trucks, high occupancy ambulance buses, ambulances and armored personnel carriers have been added to the inventory of the armed forces over the period, as well as the imminent completion of a forward operating base at Azimlibo in the Jomoro district of the Western region. And in response to the creation of additional ranks within the military, government reviewed salaries and allowances for armed forces and civilian employees upwards, effective 1st January 2020. The capacity of the Ghana National Fire Service has been raised with the procurement of five sets of extrication equipment and two hydraulic platforms procured. Indeed, when I took office in January 2017, the police service had a total of 492 serviceable cars. Government has since then procured for the, procured for the police 735 additional vehicles, including 15 operational buses, a feat unprecedented in the history of the service. 320 housing units are being constructed at National Police Training School to reduce the accommodation deficits of the service. Modern communication equipment and fragmentation project jackets have been procured and delivered to the service to protect officers and ensure effective policing. The construction of hangars at the police depot, Accra, for four helicopters already procured for the Ghana Police Service is 95% complete. An air wing unit has been established by the Ghana Police Service and six police pilots have been trained and passed out to man the wing. A new K-9 unit has been established with 30 dogs and 30 police officers. The Criminal Investigation Department has been equipped with a digital forensics laboratory. And for the, for the first time in the history of the department, crime officers are given a monthly allowance to support their investigation. We're retooling the CID Forensic Science Lab. The CID building has also now become disability friendly, and there's continuing tra training of CID officers. 84 apartment units are being constructed at Odoko in Accra for the immigration services, and they are 98% complete, and their completion will help reduce the accommodation challenges faced by officers and men of the Immigration Service. Government is also constructing an 800 inmate capacity remand prison at Dinsawam, which is 60% complete. Its purpose is to reduce further overcrowding in prisons, as remand prisons, prisoners will now be kept separately from the convict population. Mr. Speaker, these large investments in equipping our security services is inspired by the recognition that the peace and stability of our nation are critical for our development, especially as we live in a difficult and sometimes dangerous world. Mr. Speaker, amongst the milestones of our international relations have been reappointed chairman of the authority of ECOWAS for a second term. Under my leadership and in collaboration with colleagues in the region, we have restored peace and political stability to Mali through a landmark transitional arrangement which brought under control a period of bloodshed and uncertainty and which has committed itself to a roadmap for a peaceful democratic outcome from the tradition. In addition to strengthening and cooperation and deepening bilateral and multilateral trade and economic ties with host countries. It is exciting to note that presidential visits overseas have yielded a significant dividends. The reestablishment of the Economic Trade and Investment Bureau of the Ministry has enabled the position of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a strategic partner to help facilitate domestic 
and foreign investments in the country. Indeed, Ghana Investment Promotion Center has reported today a surge in foreign direct investment into our country of 2.1 billion United States dollars in 2020, compared to 1.1 billion the previous year, representing a more than 90 percent increase. Mr. Speaker, the sum total of all of this is that in spite of the ravages of the pandemic, our nation is still very much in rude health and remains very attractive to investors. Yes, we're reading from the effects of COVID-19, but I am confident that with the progress of the vaccination program, we will recover quickly and work towards putting our nation back onto the path of progress and prosperity. We're building a more inclusive society and soon things will work for all in Ghana. And then we will fulfill our true potential as the black star of Africa. Crucial, crucial to achieving this vision is my uncompromising commitment to strengthening the institutions of our democracy and managing public resources with integrity, fairness, openness, and accountability. Mr. Speaker, ours is not a government that shies away from public scrutiny. Far from it. That is not the MPP way. That is why in 2001, under the outstanding leadership of the second president of the, first, of the Fourth Republic, his Excellency Don Ajakum Kufo, and with me as his Attorney General, the criminal libel law was repealed to protect and expand media freedoms in the country. And in 2003, the Public Procurement Act was introduced to protect the public purse. That is why it was my government that took the bold steps in 2008 to bring about the establishment of an independent prosecutor for the setting up of the Office of Special Prosecutor. That is why it was my government that in 2019 enacted the Right to Information Act, which had been shared by previous administrations despite decades of agitations and civil society groups and journalists. That is why within two years of being in office, we more than doubled funding for accountability institutions of state, like SHRA, EYOKO, the Judiciary, and the Auditor General. The government and the people expect those in charge of our government institutions to do their work with professionalism and good faith. Indeed, the institutions of our nation, whether the executive, legislative, legislature, or judiciary, are working. The Supreme Court, Mr. Speaker, for example, last week determined the challenge to the validity of the 2020 presidential election and affirm this validity in a unanimous decision. Not 5-4. Not 5-4. Unanimous. Mr. Speaker, the court has spoken. It is time for all of us to move on and in a united manner confront the problems of post-COVID-19 Ghana. Let me in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, recall the following statement I made in my very first message on the state of the nation, on the Ghana I hoped to help construct a statement which is at the heart of everything government has sought to do since I took office in 2017. 
this government will be defined by integrity, sovereignty, a common ethos, discipline and shared value. It is one where we aim to be masters of our own destiny, where we mobilize our own resources for the future, breaking the shackles of the government's colonial economy and a mindset of dependency bailouts and attraction. It is an economy where we look past commodities to position ourselves in a global marketplace. It is a country where we focus on trade, not aid, a hand up, not a handout. It is a country with a strong private sector. It is a country that recognizes the connectedness of its people and the economy to those of its neighbors. This requires a forward-looking vision for our country, enabling us to confront our challenges and embrace our opportunities, not one fastened in the rear view mirror. It is a Ghana beyond aid. Mr. Speaker, I remain wholly committed to the fulfillment of this vision. May God bless us all and our homeland Ghana and make her great and strong. Thank you. members. Order, order, order. members members in accordance with standing order 58 I convey to his excellency the president the gratitude of the house honorable members again in accordance with the practice of this house a formal communication will be forwarded to His Excellency the President after the House has thoroughly 
debated this address. Honorable members, we have a lot of distinguished personalities who have come to grace the occasion. I'll now have the list with me. Honorable members, permit me to recognize the presence of the following dignitaries in the House. His Excellency Alaji Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia, the Vice President of the Republic is here with us for this special event. His Lordship Justice Enim Yebua. Honorable members, I take it again. His Lordship Justice Enim Yebua, the Chief Justice of the Republic, is also here with us. Honorable members, I also will want to welcome and appreciate the presence of Her Excellency Mrs. Rebecca Na Okwako Akufuadu, the First Lady of the Republic of Ghana. Also, Her Excellency Hajia Mrs. Sabira Ramadan Baumia, the spouse of the Vice President. The last but not the least, I don't know which of you has a girlfriend or a matu, but we don't have any dignity here called Ramatu. Honorable members, we also have the Left Honorable Madame Alice Adjua Yunas, spouse of the Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament. <laughs> 